This week saw a very significant event take place in Israel. The Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, visited Israel for three days. Prime Minister Netanyahu brought his entire cabinet, heads of all the military and police, the religious leaders, to meet Prime Minister Modi at the airport. The reason this visit is significant is found in both biblical history and prophecy. As has been discussed many times in the Bible and the news, the nation of Tarshish has a significant role to play in the time of the end. We read in Ezekiel 38 verse 13, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to take away silver and gold, to carry away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Well, who the nation of Tarshish is has been explored many times. Undoubtedly, Britain fulfills the role of Tarshish, while her former colonies, many of which now form the Commonwealth, are the young lions. The link between Tarshish and Israel goes back thousands of years. King Solomon cooperated with Hiram, king of Tyre, to obtain materials for the building of the temple and the enriching of his kingdom through the services of the ships of Tarshish. We read in 2 Chronicles 9, verses 20 to 22, all of the drinking vessels of King Solomon were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the force of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was not anything counted for in the days of Solomon, for the king's ships went to Tarshish with the serpents of Hiram. Every three years once came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Well, Tarshish has been identified both historically and archaeologically with Britain based on the ancient trade in tin, lead, and silver as cataloged in Ezekiel 37 or 27, where we read in verse 12, Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches with silver, iron, tin, and lead they traded in thy fairs. Well, this is also testified historically by Julius Caesar, who wrote his book, The Gaelic Wars, and he related to Britain, they used brass money and iron rings of a certain weight. The provinces remote from the sea produced tin, and those upon the coast iron. While well, Samuel Bocart in 1651 testified the very name of Britain is derived from this. Britain is the name given to the island by the Phoenicians when they trafficked hither for tin, calling it Baratanak, the land of tin, contracted afterwards for Bratanak, and then again softened to Britannia. Well, this is the Tarshish that was to the west of Israel, operating in the Mediterranean and beyond. This is the direction Jonah fled aboard a ship of Tarshish, trying to escape his commission to preach to Nineveh. However, Solomon was engaged with ships of Tarshish that went to the east as well. We read in 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 26 to 28, King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezion Geber, which is beside Elat, on the shore of the Red Sea, in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent in his navy his servants, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea, with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir and fetched from thence gold 420 talents and brought it to King Solomon. In fact, years later, Jehoshaphat attempted a similar feat, which was ill-fated due to the alliance with Jehoshaphat and King Ahaziah, Israel's wicked king. We read in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 35 to 37, After this did Jehoshaphat king of Judah join himself with Ahaziah king of Israel, who did very wickedly, and he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships in Ezion Geber. Then Eliezer the son of Dodava uh, of Marasha prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah, Yahweh hath broken thy works, the ships are broken, that they were not able to go to Tarshish. So there was a Tarshish to the west, but also a Tarshish to the east, where ships went, operating out of Ezion Gibir or Alat. John Thomas, in his book Elpis Israel, relates, As to Tarshish, there were two countries of that name in the geography of the ancients. Jehoshaphat built ships at Ezion Gibir, a port on the Red Sea, that they might sail hence to Tarshish. Now it will be seen by a map that they could only sail southwards towards Babel el Mandeb, from which they might then steer east or north for India. As they did not sail by compass in those days, but coastwise, they would creep around the coast of Arabia and so make for Hindustan. 
They might have sailed southward again along the coast of Africa instead of to India, but it is not likely they did, as the commerce of the time was with the civilized world, not the savage. The voyage occupied them three years. In the days of Solomon, the trade was shared between Israel and the Tyrians, for he had a navy, a sea, he had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. Well, these products point to India as the eastern Tarshish, a country which has always conferred maritime ascendancy on the power which has possessed its trade and been its carrier to the nations. This is Alpus Israel, pages uh, 395. Well, India is also identified with the young lions. It was conquered by the British, who allied themselves with the Hindus against the ruling Muslims, who were descendants of the Muslim Tamerlane or Timur, incidentally, whose grandson built the Taj Mahal. Well, eventually, the Muslims centralized themselves and are now known as Pakistan, while the Hindus were largely in the south in what is called India. India, as a British colony, formed part of the contingent of young lions who were heavily involved in the prophecy of Revelation 16, verse 13, where we read, The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. While it appears in the World War I poster that depicts the mother lion of Britain calling upon her young lion colonies to help her in defense, India is identified as one of these. Indian soldiers were involved in pushing the Ottoman Turks out of the Middle East and therefore drying up the river Euphrates during World War I. This was highlighted by the visit of Prime Minister Narendra Modi to Haifa Memorial. The Battle of Haifa took place on September 23, 1918, where the Indian 15th Cavalry Brigade attacked the forces of the Ottoman Empire, resulting in the capture of Haifa and Acre. The Indian forces were heavily engaged in battle at Megiddo and moved on to capture Haifa with heavy losses. Memorials are found in Haifa, New Delhi, and Bangalore as a testimony to the sacrifice of the brave Indian soldiers. Indians' independence was announced around the same time as Israel's in July 1947, just months before the vote in the United Nations for the creation of the State of Israel. Just like Israel would be later partitioned, the Indian colony was partitioned between the Muslim state of Pakistan in the north and the state of India in the south, which was more Hindu. India became independent August 15, 1947, while Israel became independent May 14, 1948. So Prime Minister Modi's visit to Israel is very significant as it demonstrates the picture painted years ago by the prophets is coming into being. The young lions and Tarshish, east and west, would be involved in trade with Israel in the latter days, and therefore would protest the invasion of the king of the north, or Gog. For we read in Ezekiel 38, verse 13, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, will say, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered? Of thy company take a prey to carry away silver and gold to take away cattle or goods and a great spoil and so on. Well, this week's visit saw the strengthening of ties, both economic and military, as was evidenced in the speeches given by both Prime Minister Netanyahu and Prime Minister Modi upon Modi's arrival to a warm welcome in Israel. My friend Prime Minister Narendra Modi, welcome to Israel. Prime Minister, we've been waiting for you a long time. We've been waiting almost 70 years, in fact, because yours is truly a historic visit. It's the first time an Indian Prime Minister is visiting Israel. We receive you with open arms. We love India. I'm confident of the success of our partnership for many reasons. First is the talent of our peoples. It's been said, Prime Minister, that in Silicon Valley in California, the two most common languages overheard are Hindi and Hebrew. Occasionally, one hears some native English too. Second, I believe in the success of our partnership because of the great sympathy between our peoples, the natural camaraderie between Indians and Israelis, the Jews of India, and the 100,000 Israelis of Indian descent are a wonderful human bridge between our two nations, our two peoples. 
Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi reciprocated. Excellency Prime Minister Netanyahu, ladies and gentlemen, Shalom, Lekram, Anisemya Mayot, Lehiat Po. It is my singular honor to be the first ever Prime Minister of India to undertake this groundbreaking visit to Israel. I want to thank my friend Prime Minister Nathan Yahu for the invitation and for receiving me with so much warmth. My visit celebrates the strength of centuries-old links between our societies. It was later during a joint press conference Prime Minister Modi would make clear the link between the two countries. Friends, the link between our people goes back to thousands of years when the first Jews landed on India's southwestern coastline. Since then, the Jews have flourished and their traditions and practices thrive in India. Friends, in modern times, our ties have seen rapid growth since the establishment of our full diplomatic relations a quarter century ago. Common objectives of economic prosperity, strong technology, and innovation ties, and the need to secure our society defined the space for convergent action between us. Over coming decades, we want to frame a relationship that transforms the landscape of our economic engagement. India is the world's fastest growing large economy. The common theme is clear. What ties the countries together is a large population of Jews of Indian descent, over 100,000 living in Israel, along with a similar vision of economic development, trade, and prosperity. Well, this is very fitting when India answers to the role of one of the young lions and one of the merchants of Tarshish, the eastern one. The word merchant used by Ezekiel is interesting. It is the Hebrew word kasar, meaning a trader, to go about, to travel in trade. This is exactly what Modi is doing in Israel, strengthening trade ties to bring prosperity that will build and create the great spoil so tempting to Russia in the latter days that we read of in Ezekiel 38 verse 13, where they ask, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Well, a similar need for security against Muslim extremism has also been highlighted. Later in a news conference with an Indian television station, the defense issue was highlighted by Prime Minister Netanyahu, where he stated, International solution. Uh, we share vital intelligence. Israel is a powerhouse of intelligence against terrorism. Uh, India is fighting terrorism in your part of the world. We all remember the horrible attack in Mumbai. In fact, uh, Prime Minister Modi and I just uh, uh, met with uh, little Moshe, the Israeli boy, who was saved by his Indian nanny, who was there with us as well. And we know that we face this common threat to our common civilization. So we uh, uh, have been cooperating and have decided to cooperate more intensively to battle this scourge that threatens the lives of Indians and Israelis and so many others around the world. Uh, and I think that this visit marks uh, a turning point in that common struggle. The interviewer put an interesting question to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Prime Minister, the Hamas is a threat to Israel. The Hezbollah Mujahideen, the Jaish e Mohammed, the Lashkar e Toiba are threats to India. How should we target these groups? First of all, by sharing intelligence and then cooperating in ways that I'm not sure are best discussed even on my first interview on Indian television in this historic visit.
but palestine continues to harbor hamas and pakistan continues to harbor the lashkar e toiba hizbul mujahideen jaish e mohammed israel hits the hamas back do you believe mr prime minister that india as a victim of terrorism is well within its rights to hit back at these groups directly i think that uh, every country uh, there are two requirements one is uh, to protect your people the second there is a requirement not to allow your territory to be used as a base of attacks against another country and i think this frames the uh, reference point for the uh, for the self defense that uh, every country is entitled to exercise so india rather than criticizing israel with the treatment of the palestinians is looking to it as an example of how it deals with the palestinians and the hamas terrorists embedded amongst them what was notable about this trip and picked up by the media was the absolute lack of a meeting between modi and the palestinians well, later on in the interview, referring to the murder of the parents of young Moshi and the fact their murderers have not been brought to justice, the TVU interviewer asked, What is your advice to Pakistan, Prime Minister Netanyahu? They are harboring Sayyid Salahuddin, who has been designated as an international terrorist. But they say, Pakistan says, we are not bound by any such advice because this is not a United Nations declaration. They say this is the United States move to appease India. Now, when a country like Pakistan harbors an international terrorist, how do we deal with a country like this? And what is your advice to Pakistan? Well, I've said to uh, every country around the world, don't harbor terrorists, don't support terrorists, and don't dispatch terrorists, and don't tolerate terrorists. Because sooner or later, that scorpion is going to turn around and bite you. Uh, and I've said this uh, equally to all nations. I haven't changed my view. Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, you referred to Moshe Holzberg. There is a sentimental attachment that the people of India have to Moshe because the pictures of Moshe after 2611, they stung everyone's heart. And Moshe Holzberg was a small child, I think two or three years old when he lost right. his parents right. during the 26-11 Mumbai terrorist attacks in 2008. I think he's 10 or 11 years old now. But those who yes. killed his parents, Prime Minister, uh, Rivka and Gavriel Hotsberg, they are still to be brought to book in Pakistan. What do you have to say, Prime Minister Netanyahu, about the fact that nine years after the Mumbai terrorist attacks, the orchestrators of the Mumbai attacks, Hafiz Saeed and Zakiu Rahman Lakwi have not been brought to book by Pakistan. How do we deal with a country like this now that we are working closer together? Any country that harbors prospective murderers and actual murderers, uh, and terrorists are just that, they're murderers, uh, should bring them to justice. This is an expectation and a demand that we uh, voice continually, as I do so now as well. Uh, I have to tell you that we face today, uh, between India and Israel, our two democracies, the two bookends of this vast region, we face today a rash of radical Islamic terror that comes from various sources, various directions, uh, from uh, uh, the Sunni variety, for example, uh, held, uh, headed by uh, Daesh, by ISIS, uh, the radical Shiites headed by Iran, with Hezbollah and others, and other sources. Uh, they threaten first Muslims. They kill Muslims a lot. Uh, but they also, of course, uh, threaten non-Muslims, whom they view as uh, infidels to be subjugated or eradicated. So a very large number of countries, India, Israel to be sure, but many others, including, I have to say, Arab countries in, a, in the Middle East, understand that we are in a common battle against uh, terrorists who would uh, not merely eradicate our freedoms, but actually slaughter us unless we defend ourselves. And that is producing interesting new relationships and alliances 
what is obvious to me is that India and Israel are such natural allies, being uh, first and foremost democracies, uh, that we uh, you should ask yourself, how come we didn't cooperate, not only in the battle against terrorism and against radicalism, but also in the quest to better the lives of our future, uh, of our peoples. Uh, Prime Minister Modi said uh, something very instructive. He said, life is innovation. The effect radical terrorism is having is to draw India and Israel together. But as Prime Minister Netanyahu related, also the Arab countries in the Middle East are waking up to the fact that they must ally themselves with Israel against a common enemy of radical Islam that threatens all of their societies. Sheba and Didan must confederate with the Young Lions and the merchants of Tarshish and Israel. In fact, India Today reported Netanyahu stating the two nations have agreed to cooperate against terrorism which is faced by both of them. This is a marriage made in heaven, but we are implementing it here on earth, Netanyahu said. Well, this is more true than Netanyahu understand. The prophets have written the script for the play that the prime ministers are currently performing in. The Eastern Tarshish, the Young Lion of India, is taking its place in the final world stage in preparation for the Lord's return. Now on a final note, at the end of the interview, Netanyahu made some statements regarding innovation in agriculture, some of which were comical, yet very significant. For example, yesterday, Prime Minister Modi and I visited a farm and we saw how, uh, a greenhouse actually, how uh, our satellite technology and our drone technology allows to target individual plants. So you don't have to take the water if it's a scarce resource. You don't have to spread it evenly on, a, on a big fields. Yeah. You can actually direct the irrigation to where you actually need the water. Yeah. Uh, this is a tremendous increase in productivity. I showed Prime Minister Modi today uh, uh, a graph of the most productive cows in the world. And you think, who produces more milk per cow in the world? You think maybe it's a Dutch cow or a French cow? No, it's an Israeli cow. Uh, it's a computerized cow. Every moo is computerized. And so we produce about twice the milk per cow compared to uh, an average European cow. Why shouldn't Indian farmers enjoy this? Why should they not have the benefit a more productive uh, techniques. Prime Minister, and Prime Minister Modi says they should. And Prime that's Minister, the partnership that we are doing. Minister, on, on a lighter note, we know you are great at technology, Israelis. But I found that uh, description of a, of a computerized cow <laughs> very <laughs> fascinating. Uh, pri pri Prime Minister, every, every moo, every moo is recorded. The computerized, the, the computerized cow. I would like to visit Israel and see the computerized cow myself someday. Finally, last question, Prime Minister. Netanyahu, all of India is watching you and you would be surprised how much coverage there has been across the Indian media and on Republic TV on Prime Minister's visit to Israel. Every move has been followed and listened to. Uh, now you are going to be coming to India ahead of that, ahead of your visit. What message would you like to give Prime Minister Netanyahu to the 1.3 billion people of India who have been following this iconic meeting between the heads of one of the world's two most prominent democracies. We love India. We admire India. We believe in India. And we want this partnership. Well, while it made the interviewer chuckle that every moo is recorded by these computerized cows, it drives home the statement that the Israelis of the latter days have gotten cattle and goods. And not only have they gotten cattle and goods, they are also the best in the world at producing milk with them. This is the prosperity that is growing due to the blessings from God. We are living on the edge of Ezekiel 38. So let us look to our neighbors and see how we can help each other to prepare to meet our Lord who is at the door. This has been Jonathan Bowen joining you for the Bible in the News.